Okay. Whoa. Okay. Yeah, you can start it. All right, ladies. Okay. So we're back after two week. Actually, it was only one week vacation, but um, hope you had a good vacation, good break. Um, I spent the whole first week studying so I could be gone last week. <laughs> it was it was interesting. This this is a hard topic. I will tell you that um, there's a lot of stuff, and we'll go over it. Um, before we pray, I want to kind of. Um, someone sent me something that um, really fits, and it fits in all of life, but it's really about Easter and what Easter says to us. Um, so it's um, called Waiting and the Desolation of Holy Saturday. Now, if you know anything about the three days, um, Thursday was, um, it kind of gets all shoved together, but <clears throat> most of a lot of the theologians believe that Wednesday night was their Passover. Thursday, he was arrested, went through the night, Thursday night um, to Friday morning, where they took him to Pilate. Pilate <coughs> sentenced him to death. Um, they put him in the tomb Friday. And I know if I've, I've had people in the past say, what? he wasn't in three days. He actually was. By Jewish standards, you only had to do partial days to get the three days. So he was in part of Friday, all day Saturday, part of Sunday, three days. Got it? <coughs> no, it doesn't turn into 72 hours, but it is. it works. Um, but this was so good that I wanted to read it before we pray and get started, because I think a lot of us have these things in our life, and I think we need to hear this. Sandwiched between the horror of Good Friday and the joy of Easter Sunday was the waiting and desolation of Holy Saturday. While well, these three days are unique events, sacred and specific to that time in our faith, they can serve as a helpful picture of suffering in our own lives. The emotions the disciples probably felt on those days can mirror our own in the face of tragedy and loss. On Good Friday, God incarnate was hanging on a cross to die. An innocent man sacrificed because of a weak ruler jealous leaders, and insistent mob. Yet this could not have happened if God had not ordained it. On this day, we see how God turned the worst evil into the best thing that has ever happened. Good Friday was the death of the disciples' dreams and what once felt certain. As they watched Jesus be led away by the Roman soldiers, they then nailed to a cross to die. I wonder what they thought. Days earlier, they'd been talking about who would be the greatest in the kingdom when Jesus asked, if they could drink from this cup. They were sure that they could, but this, surely the cup couldn't have meant this. The disciples might have been together when Jesus was led away, but in many ways they were all alone, each one experiencing their own unique loss. Jesus repeatedly told them this would happen, but they couldn't understand it. How could they? In the midst of our own suffering and pain, nothing is clear. We may be most, almost paralyzed with fear as we react from pure instinct. We watch the unthinkable unfold, trying to get our bearings, but constantly feeling off balance. When our world is spinning, what we see and hear can ricochet through our mind like a pinball, never settling anywhere long enough to follow it. I've been through days that felt not the same as the disciples' experience on Good Friday. <clears throat> Excuse me. Days when my story took an unexpected and horrific turn. Days when the following words left me devastated. I'm sorry your son is dead. One day you'll probably be a quadriplegic. I'm leaving you for someone else. So all of those are little sentences that you could hear in your life. We are all numb on what has felt like the Good Fridays in our lives. As we stare into the abyss, we are left with more questions than answers. What do we do when we're in a free fall and disoriented? Trust God. Trust that he is at work even when we can't see it. Trust that what looks awful now is ultimately for our good. Leah? Um, trust that, Lee and I just talked about what that verse meant in Romans 8, 28. Trust that as we look at Good Friday, we can know that God is at work even in the chaos. Holy Saturday follows Good Friday. On the first Holy Saturday, the disciples all scattered each to their own homes, John 16, 31. 
It was the Sabbath for them, a day without work, nothing to busy themselves with, just silence and stillness. I wonder if they pondered the events of the past week or talked about them together. Were they filled with regret, second-guessing what they said, ashamed of what they did or didn't do? Did they wonder what was true about what they once earnestly believed and were willing to give their lives for? Did they question with, question with the Pharisees? He saved others. Why couldn't he save himself? In Luke 25, 23, 35. Or like Jesus on the cross, they were, were they crying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In Mark 15, 34. The cup they were so anxious to drink was now empty. What would happen next? Holy Saturday follows our own catastrophic losses. The day we realize our dreams have been crushed and we're not sure how to move forward or if we even want to. Waiting seems interminable, <coughs> which means going on and on forever. For us, Holy Saturday can be days, weeks, months, or even years long. Long days of waiting in limbo, trying to process what has happened. We're afraid of what lies ahead, wondering if we dare voice our disappointment with God. Has he abandoned us? Was this real about our faith anyway? What was real about our faith anyway? Questions spring up everywhere as we struggle to understand what is beyond our understanding. Holy Saturday is important as we acknowledge all that we've lost and face our doubts and our disappointments. We may want to rush past this day to fix others who are waiting in it, to offer trite answers to ease the pain, but this day isn't one for platitudes or quick solutions. It's necessary to sit with questions as we process and heal. Holy Saturday doesn't have the fury and flurry of Good Friday, but it's still tense and intense. This is when we walk away from faith. It, <clears throat> I'm sorry, this is when some walk away from the faith. It's in the quiet as they start reevaluing what they went through, they wonder why God didn't rescue them. Why did he let them hope and make plans only to have them crumble? The echoes of the Pharisees' words with a unique twist may be ringing in their minds asking, if he is a savior and saved others, why didn't he save me? Disillusioned, many men may wonder if God even cares about them or if he's forsaken them. If only we could hear the whispers of God's voice, hear the song he's singing over us, hear the tears he's weeping with us, then maybe we'd see it differently. But many of us cannot hear that. All we hear is deafening silence. Yet in what feels like a dark night of the soul, God bids all of us to lean into him, to trust him in the dark. Nothing looks different on our holy Saturday and we have to hang on to Jesus by faith or simply trust that he is holding on to us. For those who are willing to wait, who know that hope in God will never disappoint, and I want to emphasize, never disappoint, will stir at the end of Holy Saturday. If we can stay and keep looking at Jesus through the worst, we will discover the love of God is deeper and truer than we can imagine. We'll know God's love from experience in a way <clears throat> that, uh, in, a, in a way that we haven't before. That's what happened to the disciple John. He stayed to the end watching Jesus die at the foot of the cross when the disciples ran away and John was firmly convinced of God's love as anyone who has ever lived. John's identity was as one beloved. He wrote about love more than anyone else. When you've lived through tragedy, felt it, watched it, and tasted it, and discovered, discovered God's love through it all, nothing will convince you God's love isn't real. You'll know from experience that nothing can ever separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus, Romans 8, 38, and 39. When you've been through the worst and found God faithful, Christ's love will be firmly nailed to your identity as his body was nailed to the cross. God's love will transform you if you let it. Will you endure and trust that Easter is coming? This, this Easter isn't the physical resurrection of Jesus, which was a one-time event, but his rising from the grave means loss and death will not have the last word in our lives. So our Easter can be the resurrection of our dreams or the redemption of our suffering or the joy of heaven. Easter is coming for all of us. For all of us who've ever watched our nightmares come true and wondered what comes next, for all of us who have cried bitter tears in the dark waiting for the dawn to come, for all of us who felt forsaken and aren't sure whether we're seen or loved, the story isn't over yet. As we wait and cry out to God in our despair, we will soon discover that God is nearer than we ever thought and that he loves us extravagantly. We'll see that just as night gives way to day, the crucifixion always gives way to the resurrection. So if you're living in the horror of Good Friday or the agonizing stillness and intensity of Holy Saturday, 
Can you hang on a little longer? Easter is coming, I promise. The best is yet to be. Um, I think talking about end time stuff, we've got a lot of stuff coming down the pike that is not really fun stuff. But again, the best is yet to come, and that's what we look forward to. So let's pray. Father, we just came through the Easter weekend, and um, for most of us, we understand that that represents life to us. Um, your death on the cross made a way for me to be right with God and to be saved and to know that my future is secure, and that is huge. And Lord, I just thank you for the gift of Easter, but I also know from talking to a lot of ladies here, they are going through really hard things. And Lord, you know this life is difficult. You told us it would be, and yet you told us you'd be with us. And so Lord, no matter what each lady is experiencing right now, whether it be death of someone or one of their kids walking away, or it may be um, health issues they've been diagnosed with that they can't face right now, Lord, you have said you'd walk with us in it, and um, it's those times that we need to lean into you. I know um, Satan does his best work in those times if we isolate, and so Lord, help us, one, to stay with you and to learn to lean into you, but also, two, help us to lean into each other. That's what you created the church and friendships for, and so Lord, I ask you to... Um, carry each of us in our pain, that you would make yourself known to us in new ways through that pain, that we would get to know you even better than we do now, and be even more assured of your love and your redemption. I thank you. I thank you for pain in our life, Lord, because otherwise we would be oblivious to other people and other people's pain. I thank you that we are told to comfort one another with the comfort we have received, and only if we've gone through tough things, can we receive that comfort from you? So I ask that you would be here in our presence um, as we go into these things, as we talk about how um, the church and um, religion is changing in our day and age and the things we're seeing. And it is hard stuff, Lord, and yet we trust you in it. And so I thank you for that. I thank you for your word that gives us that. Help us as we go out from here um, at the end of today, that we would be more intent on following you more closely and sharing you with others. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Um, of course, I'm always studying, and what I realized is there was one area that I didn't really talk about in the Ezekiel part of the Ezekiel War, and I wanted to kind of just take a, a second, it won't take me very long, um, to give you kind of the timing that it might come in. And this one magazine that I had, which I was looking through stuff about what we're going to study today, which I'll get to later, that I came across this. I knew I had it, but I forgot it. So there you go. In my old age, I forget things. Um, so the timing of Gog and Magog, which is that war that Russia leads and all of its, all of its friendships and stuff, um, the greatest mystery, and I'm just going to read this quickly, and you, you can ask a question if you want. I don't know if I'll have the answer, but here it is. The greatest mystery concerning this war is its timing. Most have placed it at the beginning of the tribulation. Others delay its start to the middle of the tribulation. But increasingly, in recent years, the tendency has been to place it before the beginning of the tribulation. The best discussion of timing that has not yet that has yet been written can be found in Rod, Ron Rhodes, R-H-O-D-E-S book, Northern Storm Rising. He wrote it in 2008. He concludes that it is most likely to occur about three and a half years before the tribulation begins. Now here's his reasoning. His conclusion is based on the following reasoning. The tribulation lasts seven years. Ezekiel 39.9 says, the Jews will spend seven years burning the weapons that will be captured when Russia and its allies are destroyed in the Battle of Gog and Magog, possibly nuclear fuel, which we kind of talked about. 
Revelation 12 says that the Jews will flee from the land into the Jordan three and a half years into the tribulation when the Antichrist tries to eradicate them. Therefore, the only way the Jews could spend seven years burning the weapons is for the war to begin about three and a half years before the start of the tribulation. Um, this raises a question. Does this mean the wars of Psalm 83 and Ezekiel 38 and 39 must occur before the rapture? Not at all. The rapture could occur any time before, during, or after these wars. Keep in mind that the rapture is not what marks the beginning of the tribulation. The tribulation will begin when the Antichrist signs a peace treaty with Israel. Several years could elapse between the rapture and the beginning of the tribulation. So that's kind of... Um, I thought that was a good answer for timing. Um, I think it's going to be before the tribulation. Um, just everything I've read and, and the books I've read kind of point to that. It also makes sense because it takes out a lot of the religious questions that will go into the seven years of tribulation where the Antichrist sets himself up as God. So there's that too. Um, somehow he feels free because there's no religion in the world at that point to stand up and say, worship me, I'm God. So any questions on that? I know that's going backwards a ways, but um, okay, Jude, and I don't know who has the mic, so. Just press the button. It'll go green. Um, Say again, the tribulation doesn't start until the Antichrist is revealed? Is that what you said? No, the Antichrist signs a peace treaty with signs Israel. Signs a peace treaty, okay. That's the beginning of the seven years. That's when you know the seven years has started. No, we, the Antichrist won't be revealed until the restrainer is taken out, which we believe the, is the Holy Spirit, which that would probably mean the church is out of the area at that point because he's promised to be with us until the end, which... That will end that period of time. Anyone else? Okay. Um, so open your books to 173. I think after this week, we have three weeks left. Um, and I'm trying to get done in those weeks, and I'm trying to figure out how to... Um, I'm going to give you an assignment. Um, so um, next week, go to Chapter 17, The Signs of the Culture, which is um, a little bit longer than some of them. Um, the signs of technology is going to be, there's a lot of stuff to, to do with that one, obviously. Um, so one of the things you might want to do with the signs of the culture, also read chapter 19, the signs of convergence. Um, that, that's pretty short, um, will kind of cover it with, it kind of goes into the signs of the times we're living in um, as we look at the world. Technology, I think there's a lot of areas we can go into um, in technology to explain some of the things that are happening and quickly happening. Um, so we'll save that for its own week, and then the last week we'll do the last three chapters, which are all fairly quick. And we may not get to that second chapter next week, we'll see. Um, but today we're going to talk about the spiritual signs that seem to be everywhere. Um, it's hard to be, um, maybe it's my age, it's hard for me, to be honest, to see where the church has come to in the United States at this point. Not just in the United States, the world. Um, it's, it's a huge change. It is very evident everywhere you look, um, even in some of your own families, and we'll talk about that. Um, he starts with the positive signs, which I thank him for that, because we haven't had many positive signs in this book so far of what's going on. Um, 
one of the positive signs is the gospel being preached to the whole world. And we're on page 175. I'll, I'll quickly go back to 174 because I think he starts, I think how he starts this chapter is very, very good because it reminds us of how um, we how we kind of ignore things until, it, until things really happen. And he, he talks about moving to a different area and experiencing the first time he had a microburst, which um, if you've read the chapter, you'll know that the microburst is this storm that comes up um, and it, it really um, doesn't seem all that bad until all of a sudden it hits and it acts almost like a tornado, um, but it's very, very quick. Um, it's not like a tornado that goes on for miles. So um, I will tell you, when I lived out on the river, it's kind of funny now, I look back at that. When I was reading this, I remembered this. Just down from my house, about four, how, four or five houses down, as our little road was like a smile. You turned onto it on River Bluff, and both ends come out on the same road, Beans Eddy. Um, but right on the curve, as you go down from our house and onto Beans Eddy again, there was this huge storm that came up. It was bad. I mean, it was, it was pretty windy. But during that storm, I heard all these noises, and I couldn't figure out what they were until the next day when all the people on the corner were basically out cutting trees. Now, on our lot, nothing went down. But down there, every, a lot of things had gone down. Houses were damaged. Two or three houses had some damage on them. A lot of trees down. Well, the government came in, put up a big, they, I, I think they did it by helicopter, actually, went over the site and declared it a microburst. So within this storm, this wind came straight down like a tornado, but it wasn't a tornado because the trees were all laying in different directions. And that's the difference. Tornado always turns a certain direction and the trees always go in a certain direction. Unfortunately with this, all the trees were laying differently. So they knew it had to be a microburst. It came straight down and just destroyed a bunch of trees all laying in different directions. And it was a very small area. It was like two or three lots, literally. Um, so that's what he's talking about. Uh, in this, on 174, and he says, during the microburst, we never saw the wind, rather we saw the effects of the wind. Also, the storm seemed to pop up out of nowhere, but it had been developing for some time. With spiritual signs, it's much the same. And then he talks about the, the Bible gives us spiritual signs, last paragraph, to look for as we end the church age, at the end of the church age approaches. Some are sub, subtle, subtle or hidden from view of most, while others, like the microburst, tornadoes or hurricanes. What is unique about this particular sign category is there are both positive and negative signs. So when he starts with the positive, um, I think that's a good thing. So in Matthew 24, 14, it says, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached to the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then will come the, the end will come. Um, so he's talking to his disciples before he's even died, and he's basically telling them that before the end, because that's one of their questions in, in 20, Matthew 24, when will the end come? Now, their end is different from our end, I will tell you that. As Jews, they're looking for Christ reigning in Jerusalem. That's what they thought he came for the first time. That's why so many people left him at the end, when they realized he wasn't going to do what they thought he was going to do. They thought he had come to be king, to place himself on the throne. He would get rid of Rome. He would rule from Jerusalem. That is their promise from the Old Testament. We know it as the millennial kingdom. Yes, the church will be part of it. Yes, we serve with, we will serve under him. We will rule with him. But the promise isn't as much about us, the church, as it is to Israel. Israel has never seen that fulfilled. Christ has never ruled, ruled from Jerusalem. So that's really what they were looking for. So one of the signs he told them before the end, 
which would start the millennial kingdom, is the gospel will be reached in all nations. Every nation will hear. Um, I just read a stat about three weeks ago, and I hope I get this right. They figure that they will have at least a portion of the Bible um, done for every language group by the year 2026. Two years. Um, why is that? It used to take decades to translate. What has changed? Computers. Computers, you put the words in the computer, the, as many words as you know from their language, and the computer will spit out a translation. Now, the, the part that's hard, and I will tell you this, for missionaries working with those people groups is learning the language and trying to find words that can be used to talk about a lot of the things in the New Testament. Because that's the part they're going to give them first, is parts of the New Testament. Probably the book of John or, or another book. Um, so they have to figure out those words, and then they have to figure out how to spell those words, because most of these people groups don't write, they don't read. Then they have to teach the people how to read those words, so that when there is a translation, they can do something with it. So it, it's, a, it's a long process. Um, so when he talked to the disciples, what they didn't realize is this was going to take over 2,000 years to do. I think they thought, hmm, that's, that shouldn't be that hard, right? Um, yeah, they, but they, they moved out. They did their job. We would not be here today if they had not done their job, which tells me I need to be doing my job today so that someone in the future has a chance that I had, um, whether it be giving to missions work, you know, people who are translating. I mean, we've got a young man from our church who's translating the Bible for a group of people that don't have any parts of the Bible. Big deal. Um, so he says this on the top of page 175, this movement spread out from Jerusalem to the entire Roman Empire and beyond, reaching portions of European continent, Asia, and North Africa within a few hundred years. Fast forward to the Great Awakening of the 70s and the 40s, 1730s and 1740s, when iconic figures like George Whitfield, Jonathan Edwards preached to thousands at a time. This and other factors helped lead the modern missionary movement of the late 1700s, which with the intent of fulfilling the Great Commission. Um, which really he's got written here in Matthew 28, 19, and 20, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, Spe teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I will be with you always to the very end of the age. So he's still with us. Fast forward again to the early 19th. Whoop, I think I just, did I just lose the mic? Came back on. Okay. Fast forward again to the early mid 1900s, which God used evangelists like the late Billy Graham, as well as many Christian ministries to reach millions with the gospel. Billy Graham filled stadiums all over the world and used emerging satellite broadcasting technology to reach as many people as possible. Um, the fact that Billy Graham preached at 417 crusades in 185 countries on six continents and reached more than 210 million people. Actually, some of those things are still being shown on the internet, still going around the world. Fast forward again to our day with the internet now reaching almost every area of the globe more than ever before, the gospel is going to the entire earth. Um, so Billy Graham Center at Wheaton College, if you've never been down there, it's kind of an interesting place. It's, it was stated that the Great Commission would be fulfilled by 2021 to 2026. And I think the last stat said the last groups should get parts of their Bible by 2026. By that time frame, every people group on earth will have heard the gospel and had some portion of scripture translated into their language. Um, so the gospel is still going out. If you read anything about um, the closed countries of the Mideast where there is a huge underground church growing just like it did in China and it's still doing in China 
Um, it is now in the Middle East, which is very close to any kind of missions, and yet they can get stuff on the internet, broadcasts. It used to be radio. Well, you can block radio bands. It's harder to block all the internet sites. And so with that, um, they are listening to people in their own language preaching the gospel to them, and they are being saved as we speak. So the church, even in closed countries, is growing phenomenally, um, which is really a good thing. Um, I think sometimes we are so oblivious, we have so much stuff that we are inundated with. How many of you have more than five Bibles in your house? Most of us. I think I probably have 25. Um, I've given away some, but um, yeah, I still have a lot of Bibles. Um, and on top of it, now I have a phone that carries any translation I want, which I, I go to a lot, and I just flip through the translations if I don't understand a verse. I look at five or six translations, and I go, got it. I understand, <laughs> which is wonderful. Couldn't do that in the past. Grew up on the King James Version, which that's how I read that one verse. I'm sorry about that. That's my background coming in. Um, but I love having the different translations to be able to figure out what's going on. So basically, that's what's happening in the world right now. We have a question, which I probably won't be able to answer, but... Um, the other thing that I was thinking, um, and I was just having this conversation with my husband the other day, um, that could it mean also that it doesn't have to have um, all these translations before the tribulation time begins? Because you've got the 144,000 that are going to be going throughout the world, and then you've got... Um, two angels. An angel, the angel, the, well, an angel to two, two witnesses. So it, it really doesn't have to um, No, and I don't completed. think that's the end. So the end isn't until the end of the tribulation. So yes, I think it will continue going on all the way through the seven years. The fact is that with the computers now, they believe that almost every people group in fact, they're saying every people group will have a portion of scripture by 2026. Does that mean the rapture won't happen until after that? No. There really is nothing that the rapture needs to happen before we're raptured. It could happen today. It could happen three years from now. It could happen 10 years from now. I think it's in the near future. I don't think it's in the far future because of other signs that are happening. Um, one is the state of Israel, um, but yes, that end that he's talking about, that Christ is talking about to the disciples, is the end of seven years tribulation, because it's, remember, the seven years tribulation is all about Israel. Who's he talking to here? Twelve disciples from Israel. So we have to kind of separate the end from the end. Our end may be a different end, it is a different end than the end for the Jewish people. So there's that. But the fact is, with computers, by the year 2026, everyone should have a portion of the Bible, which is huge. It's one of those things that you think, I didn't think it would be in my lifetime. When I was growing up and hearing this, there's no way, as it took forever for missionaries to translate to one group of people um, to try to figure out words, try to write them down, and then try to teach them at the same time. With computers, that has speeded up immensely. So it is way better, um, way faster, and it, it's a great asset. So, um, yeah, there is that. Um, revival in the darkest places. And we kind of talked about this a little bit with, with the fact that the, that the word is going out. While Christianity wanes in the West, for the first time ever, revival is exploding in some of the darkest, most oppressive countries on earth. In Iran, for example, thousands of Muslims are turning to Christ in response to internet ministries and Christian programming and satellite television over radio waves. There are also many reports of Muslims having dreams of Jesus reaching out to them. 
Elam Ministries estimates that there are more than 360,000 Christians in Iran. <clears throat> in 1979, there were only about 500. So 79 to today, you know, that's a pretty good increase, and it increases exponentially over that. So if there's 360 when he wrote this, and I think it was 18 when he wrote this book, um, we're now at 24. Um, yeah, it was 18. That's, you know, again, six more years. Six more years, and one of the things with the dreams is what happens is Christ will come to them in a dream. They know it's Christ. Um, I've heard so many testimonies of this online. It's, it's just interesting to listen to. They know it's Christ, he, and they feel this incredible love to them. Now, what you have to know about their religion is there is not one word in the entire book that says love, nothing. So when he comes to them and they feel this incredible love out of him and they know it's Jesus, he says that, he either says it to them or they just intuitively know it. He often tells them, if you wanna know about me, go to, and he will give them another person's name. So if you think of back in 1979, where did I just, where did I just read that? Um, yeah, I mean, I'm going back. 500, he only had 500 people in the whole country he could send them to. Now he's got 360,000 and probably more than that now. And the internet, like I said, has changed everything. And I will tell you, these countries will try to block certain things off the internet. The problem is they just pop up somewhere else. The internet's very good at that. If they close down one thing, they open another, and, and people find it. Um, they're led to it by the Holy Spirit. And again, he's calling people out from all nations. So it's, it is going around the world, whether it's by missions or by the internet. Um, that, and we're gonna talk about technology, both good and bad, um, in a couple weeks. Very interesting that the same thing that takes some really bad stuff and sends it into your home also takes really good stuff and sends it into your home. Choices. Um, so yeah, there is revival coming. Um, the phenomena is occurring in many other parts of the Muslim world as well as in various Syrian refugee camps. And, and um, Joel Rosenberg reported that in 1960 to 2010, the number of Muslims that have converted to faith in Christ has grown from fewer than 200,000 to some 10 million people. Now that's worldwide. They get that as they do surveys. They have people, you know, say, you know, send their stuff back in. He's got a ministry that goes to a lot the Palestinian world. So again, it moves out from Israel into Palestine. Um, I notice in this book, and I, and I will be honest with you, um, not much is said about Israel. Yes, Israel has churches in it. People are being saved, but it's a very slow process. It's really dripping. It, it, if it's pouring out in other countries, it's dripping in Israel. That's what the seven years are about. Um, so again, God will turn his face back to Israel and he will bring Israel to himself and he will show Israel many signs that he is God and that he is there. So in every, in every place of the world, is the gospel going out? Yes. In some places, it's a lot faster growing than other places and that is very natural. Um, it didn't say billions. In Revelation, it talks about every nation, every people group, every language will be represented in heaven. He doesn't say billions from every nation people group. He said some from every nation people group. So again, we're, it's always going to be a minority. I think sometimes in, in the West, in the past, we've thought we can win this area for Christ. Never going to happen. It's always narrow road, wide road. Go to scripture. Um, same with the disciples. Um, every disciple but John was basically killed for spreading the gospel in a country that was used to Jews, but they didn't like what they talked about, and so they killed them. The world's still on out, but it, 
was to only certain people that God was calling to himself. Um, that, that's part of scripture also. So I think when he tells us to go to everyone, it's up to him who comes to him. It's not up to me. So I'm not told who is and who isn't. I'm told to spread the word. And that's what they did. And that's what we continue to do. Um, so don't get discouraged. Just keep doing it. God will call who he's going to call. And the Holy Spirit will draw them. And that's not up to me. And it's a good thing it's not up to me. We would probably die. Um, so there's a lot of stuff in that. In that there is... And I don't like the word revival. Revival means something was living and has been revived. What it really is, is new life is being spread out. I don't know how, what word that would come in, but um, it really is new life. It's not reviving a life. It's really, you know, Scripture calls it a new creation is being formed, and that's what it is. So... New creatures are being formed all over the world. Whether we know it or not, it's happening. Um, it's happening in the U.S. It's happening in other places. Um, he gets into the prophecy being unsealed, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time because we spent quite a bit of time on this. He goes to Daniel 12.4, says about knowledge increasing in the time of the end likely has a dual application. Knowledge in general has absolutely exploded as the understanding of Bible prophecy. As a world stage continues to be set, prophecies that perplexed experts from a previous generation are now understood with clarity. The closer we get to the tribulation, the more we are able to understand about end times prophecies. I will tell you from when I was young, probably in my late teens into my 20s and 30s, when it then prophecy was talked about a lot then it went dead for many years and it's pretty dead right now I have a better understanding of certain things that I could not envision for the life of me when I was younger um, some of them has to do with technology some of them has to do with every people group being drawn I mean I thought it was going to be hundreds of years before um, more every people group had their word. I couldn't visualize that the computer was going to change everything. Um, I couldn't visualize how, uh, some examples, the Antichrist was going to run the world and, and sales like you could not buy or sell unless you had the mark. I thought, wow, that's going to take a lot of people. Well, it's not going to take any people. You can use computers. Um, artificial intelligence, which we'll talk about in a couple weeks. But again, things have changed. Things look different. Um, countries that I never dreamed would have the word, have the word, and, and the church is growing. So in my own country, and that's what we'll get into in a few minutes here, the, it seems like it's dying out. Christianity is on a very fast track to death. Um, Europe is dead totally. Um, the amount of Christians in both England and Europe are minuscule because the word is not going out, which is really sad. Are there people being saved? Absolutely. Are there a lot? No, because there's just not a lot of Christians sharing the word, and I think that's happened in the U.S. too. Um, so let's talk about false Christs and cults because that has been a thing in the past, and it still is a big thing. Um, there have always been small-scale false Christs, particularly in the early church, and again, as we draw closer to the tribulation period. During the 1800s, the number of cult groups ramped up broadly from the founding of Mormonism and the Jehovah's Witnesses, along with others. Since we've experienced a major explosion of cults around the world, um, there are so many offshoot groups, even under the name Christian, which is really sad. Um, I've read a couple books that have talked about how the church, the evangelical church that was speaking the word for many generations, 
many of them have strayed off into areas that they should not be in. Um, one very prominent preacher who was very famous kind of has abandoned the whole idea um, of the Bible, and he wrote a book, Love Wins. Um, don't read it. It's a lie. Um, he basically says God is love. He's not going to send anyone to hell. Hell was not made for man. God's love is going to conquer all. Problem is, Scripture doesn't say that. Muggsy, you got a question? Just one second. Oh. Um, so, as you start to read certain things in our day and age, you've got to be very careful. Um, some really good Christian music has come out of some churches that basically, when you start to read their theology, are cults. Um, and every church I've ever been in sings them. Um, because they're great songs. But what, I but what you have to know is out of those songs, those churches are flourishing financially because that's where they make their money. Um, it just is what it is what it is. You have to be so careful where we get our stuff. So um, the idea of cults isn't all that weird. The term cult is fairly modern word with many applications. Most cults were started by a single leader. Some of these people claim to be prophets or messengers of God, and that's where a lot of the churches within the Christian world, if you read anything about their, their leaders being prophets or messengers of God, that they have special messages from God or they have prophecy that has been told to them, run as fast as you can. That is, that's a huge sign. Most cults grow out of Christian and Jewish roots, use scripture selectively and twist it or add to it. The evil forces behind cults know that a little bit of truth is needed to sell the lie. Now that's a Satan thing, and I will get into that. I'm thinking of doing a study next year on that. Um, it, it is a satanic thing. Satan has always done that from, if you go back to the garden, what did he use? God's words, and he twists them. He gives just enough truth to pull you in, and then he lies. That's the way he works. Um, Jesus' prediction that the rise of false Christ would be among the birth pains, the increase of the, as the tribulation period draws closer, I also believe is significant that the rise of modern-day cults has occurred during the same century that the Zionist movement for a, Jew, a Jewish homeland began. Um, and then he gives a partial list of cults at the bottom of this page. There are so many more than that. You, this whole book could be filled with the names of the cults in the world um, without any other words in it. That's the unfortunate part. Um, so one of my magazines, I want to, um, got to make sure I'm doing the right one here. I have them numbered because I was bringing several this year. This today, I mean, not this year. Um, it talks about, um, it, it's, a, it's an article um, that talks about how Christianity is changing um, in the U.S., Europe, other places. Um, and I'm not going to read all of it. It's a long article, but I'll start it. C.S. Lewis wrote, I believe in Christianity as I believe that the sun has risen, not only because I see it, but because but because by it, I see everything else. Um, but in, in this day, um, we're, we're living, today the moon of radical secularism has obscured the light of God. God is still God, but our nation no longer sees him as such. Equally devastating, we are invited to accept false gods who can neither give us light or give us answers to life's most basic questions. As a result, we are floundering as individuals, as family, and as families, and as a nation. When God is not welcome in our culture, we find people live randomly, not knowing their ultimate purpose, but waking up each day with faint hope, ecking out whatever pleasure they can find as they pass through their lives in a meaningless quest for significance. If you've gone onto any college campuses, that's exactly what's happening. Um, they have no idea why they're here. They have no idea that there is a plan, they are just trying to survive and find happiness, which is really sad. God himself explains the reason for this eclipse. 
And behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, or his ear dull that it cannot hear, but your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. That's out of Isaiah. <clears throat> Israel did the same thing that many in the U.S. are doing right now. They basically started to worship other gods, and at that point, God chose to hide his face. Um, <clears throat> people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil, John 3.19. We must grieve for this generation. They seek hope and meaning in all the wrong places. Proverbs 4.19, the way of the wicked is like deep darkness. They do not know over what they stumble. And that's, that really, I think, this, the world we live in really looks like that. When God hides his face from us, we are left without a rudder, without a man, and without a purpose. And the consequences are devastating. With the God of the Bible abandoned, we have no choice but to look to ourselves for guidance and meaning. So we are tempted to choose gods that are much more to our liking. We choose gods we, cannot, we can control, gods that will not judge but affirm us, gods who do not demand repentance. Such a God does not create us. We create him, her, them and that's very true um if you've ever tried to witness to someone and they will say well your truth is your truth and my truth is my truth what is truth then i mean then there is no truth and how do you live by your truth yes god is coming is becoming just like us affirming inclusive and culturally progressive and that really is what we've seen spirituality is religion without god it is self-acceptance without confronting sin. It is self-redemption without the need for Christ. It is words without meaning and experience without substance. And it is the pretense religion without having to believe anything significant. In short, it is atheism without the stigma and self-exaltation hidden behind platitudes. And so they, they have all their reasons for doing what they're doing, but the bottom reason is I'm pleasing myself. I'm trying to make myself happy. I am often asked if I think that God will someday judge America, but America is already being judged. In fact, proof of this is our moral depravity. Three times we have re read in Romans 1 that God gave them up a reference to people who rejoice in unnatural and perverse sexual activity. But please note, he gave them up to this depravity. This means God's judgment has led to our depravity. In other words, God gave them up to do what we see every day on the news. I don't know if you have noticed the difference in TV shows. There is not one TV show that does not have a token other person in it. Um, and they make fun of Christianity. We are fools, we are straight, we are, I mean, we, we're a joke, um, which is okay. I don't mind that. Um, in their estimation, we are. What really bothers me the most is they don't talk about the suicide rate among those people. Um, they don't talk about the depression that they're dealing with. They don't talk about children who have changed genders who can no longer go back and grieve that and commit suicide. They won't talk about that because that will prove them wrong. So there's that. Um, the one thing I'll disagree with them on, I think God is starting to judge the world. The full judgment won't come till the seven years, but if you look at what God is withholding in many places, Europe's several years ahead of us, um, which is sad. Um, Europe, a lot of Europe, England being one of them, were the leaders in missions for years and years and then it quit, and now there's hardly anyone going out. There's more missionaries going out from South America than there are from the U.S. and Europe combined. Um, we've given up, we, after England and Europe were the missions groups, England was the high one, the U.S. became number one for years and years and years in, in sending missionaries. We no longer hold that spot, we shouldn't because we're not sending that many missionaries. I know people who are going into missions that it literally takes them years to raise enough money to go on the field. That is sick. Which tells you 
the Christian people are not interested in missions. We don't care if they go on the mission field. We don't want to give to it. We would rather give to other things, our own comfort, our own places, but, and we've lost the right, um, which is really sad. As a nation, we are at a crossroads. We will face the future with optimism because of our faith in fallen humanity, or we will be op optimistic because we believe in God and that history will unfold according to his plan. So you've got two choices. Either you're optimistic because you believe we are evolving into a better society, which I don't know many people who would say that, or you are optimistic because you know God's plan is being basically played out in our midst. Um, other churches and, and we as individuals must seriously evaluate our lives and ministries. This is not a time for the trumpet to give an uncertain sound. It is not a time for our lights to dim and grow weary in well-doing. It is a time to renew our faith in a sovereign God who has brought us to this moment to represent him at a time when nations rage. Coming out of Psalm 2-4 but he who sits on the heavens laughs. Um, I've always loved that psalm. I just read it this week, and I kind of chuckled at it. I, I chuckle every time I read it, because the nations rage against God. They're going against God and his mandates, and God sits in heaven and laughs and says, you think you have any power? You wait. Um, we don't. We have no power. Humans don't have power. God's going to take it all away. We must both be bold and loving. We must be courageous and sensitive. We must grieve without rancor. We must cling to the gospel, sharing the redemption of Christ with as many as will hear. We must point men and women to the light of the world and be willing to suffer the consequences of our identification with the one who died, that we might have life. This is a tall order, but this is the task to which we have been called. It's interesting to me, and I think it's going to start happening in the U.S., that pastors in Europe in England are now being silenced. If they can't silence them um, by threatening them, they will start to take away stuff. They will take away their homes, their churches, and at some point they will probably imprison them. That's already happened in Russia. Um, I mean, there's tons of countries that imprison or kill Christians. I think that's probably coming to the West very soon. I think we're going to have to face that. Um, the question is, will you be bold or will you go silent because you want to save your life? And then you have to decide, if I save my life here, what will I say when I stand before God? And that's a hard question. But that's where we're at in the time we live in. Um, You know, that's a question that haunts me um, because I don't know. And I won't know unless that day comes. And um, I, I, I don't spend time imagining that because it's futile. But it's by faith that I am in his word and in relationship with him now. And I'm trusting that if I should glorify him by being martyred, he's going to enable me to do that too. Um, because otherwise, I know myself. <laughs> I'm going to say, um, no, comfort, please. So uh, I, I'm trusting God that he's going to get me exactly where he wants me. Absolutely. God never, it's interesting that we're talking about this because I was listening to a podcast on the way down of a, a man who spent nine years in prison in Russia. He was Jewish um, for dissension. He was talking out about Russia. And that was back in the 80s. He said it's happening again today. There are more um, people in prison that have spoken out, and I know some of them are Christians, um, against what's going on in Russia, that they're being imprisoned, they're political prisoners. So it, it is still happening in our world. It's never stopped. It never will stop. Um, and you're right. You can't prepare for it, but you can. Um, 
I can't promise you I'll be able to stand, but I know the promises of God that I will be able to stand. He will only give you the power to stand when it's your time to stand. But like she said, you have to be in the word. You have to know the word. You have to have an intimate relationship with Christ. It can't be a casual relationship with Christ. You have to lean into him with everything you've got. When I've told you, figure out your idols, again, I'll ask you, how much time of the day do you spend thinking about things? Your families, your kids, your grandkids, your house, um, what you're going to do this summer, your vacation. Those are all become idols when they take up most of our thinking time. Is most of your day thinking about Christ or other things? Evaluate yourself. Because if it's other things, what I will tell you, when the day comes to stand, you will not stand. Um, that, that's a promise of scripture. So the ones who stood in the early church were the ones who had intimate relationship with Christ. And they were absolutely convinced he was the Messiah, that he had died for their sins, and they were promised a future that we cannot believe. That's what made them stand. If you don't have that, you won't stand. Doesn't say you won't go to heaven. You will, but you will have a lot of regrets, and you will wish you had done more to stand. On that note, never in my life, to, we've, we've talked about this stuff forever. It's been almost 40 years of study. Never in my lifetime did I think I'd see this happening, and I don't know how we've lived lives of comfort and ease, and I can't even fathom the transition it's going to take mentally to just prepare but I do know God will when we come before whoever he'll give us what we need to say at the time and and just this last week on the news I was watching um, in Canada right now which I find interesting even a lot of the stuff that's blocked from there but they um, have a law that's going into place a hate speech law where um, it the law says it's the intention of your heart that's going to put you in prison. So if you come out against anything that they don't deem, you know, that's hate, so you can't hate whatever someone is um, doing that sin, you can't hate that. And I was listening to a reporter from there, and she said, um, and all the newscasters, all the journalists can be, you know, put in prison for reporting the stuff that's happening. And this girl said, um, you can go to prison and serve a life term, which in Canada, very few people ever serve life terms, even for murder. And But this, this new law, this hate speech law, which we're hearing a lot here, will put you in prison. And I just shake my head and say, it doesn't even make, it, it's like, un, it's an unbelievable thing to me that it, we're at that place. Yeah. I've actually had to think about it because I know what I'm saying is going out on the airways and some of the stuff I'm saying will be considered hate speech. So, will I go to prison? Maybe. Um, never thought I'd see it. I, so, I, I, look, I look at a lot of you. A lot of you are my age, maybe a little older, maybe a little younger. Even the, those who you are young, if you look back, you know, into the... 50s, 60s, even 60s, even 70s, the majority of people were going to a church. Now, I won't say they were Christians, but they believed in God, and they went to church on Sunday mornings. Even on Easter Sunday, I will tell you, high, high majority of people never step foot through, through a door. So in my lifetime, I've watched from the majority of people probably 90% of the people I knew went to church to now maybe 10% of the people I know go to church. Everyone else stays home. And I'm guessing most of you see that. Um, that's, that's where we're at. They don't even want to acknowledge God. Could you use, lose your life over it? Absolutely. When Christ said, take up your cross and follow me, that's exactly what he meant. It, the one thing that I will say that I have learned in 72 years, God never promised me a happy life here on earth. In fact, he promised me it was going to be a painful life because he said, they hated me, they will hate you, right? So why am I surprised? And yet, we always are. Um, and yet, 
I will take my 70 or 80 some years, I don't know how long I'll live, and be miserable because I have eternity to be happy. And that's what you have to, that's what you have to weigh. Are you willing to step out and say things that people are gonna take as hate speech because you're telling them that there's only one way to heaven or are you not willing? And if you're not willing, again, you may go to heaven, you may be saved, but you will answer to God. And I think there's gonna be a lot of shame. Um, so that's just, that's where we're at. So turn the page, it gets worse. <laughs> Uh, isn't that always the way? Well, each of these cha I will tell you, each of these chapters are challenging. Each of these chapters have little things that sometimes you don't look at, but when you look at them in all of the view, you go, oh my word, we're a lot closer than I thought we were. That's the point. Um, apostasy. So Christianity is losing its foundational stronghold upon the West, and secularism, cults, and occult influences are filling the void. Recent studies show that Christians are more biblically illiterate than ever, and many denominations now have a form of godliness but deny its real power, coming out of 2 Timothy 3.5. A 2017 Barna study revealed that only 17% of professing Christians hold to a biblical worldview. A biblical worldview is when you view everything in the world through what the Bible says. So biblical worldview does not allow you to say certain things, and I'll do an easy one, that couples living together before marriage is right. How many of you have kids or grandkids or whoever living together before marriage? Because the excuse is we've got to get to know each other because we may not be right for each other. Problem with that, stats, and these are secular stats, show divorce rate is way higher in people who live together before marriage than people who never lived together before marriage. And yet it's so common within our churches. We have people in every congregation I am in that are living together and we're not calling it out. That's been going on for decades. 60s changed everything on that. It, it's our, it's, I feel like it's my generation that's ruined a lot of things. That is one of the things we've ruined. Um, before that, people didn't live together. Um, did sex still happen? Absolutely. But it, it wasn't just, a, I'm a Christian, I know this is wrong, but I'm going to do it anyway because it's right for me type thing. That's, that's where we're at. Um, he talks about colleges that were founded on Christian roots, Harvard, Yale, and Princeton. Since 2001, more than 500 churches in London have been turned into private homes and mosques, while 423 new mosques have opened. So again, he's just using one city. Um, I just read a stat that if things don't change, which it doesn't look like they're going to, within the next five years, London will be predominantly Muslim. That's interesting. And it's intentional. Even in certain evangelical cir circles, apostasy is trying to metastasize. Pastors like Brian McLaren and authors like Rob Bell, and I'll tell you Rob Bell was the one who wrote Love Wins, are per persuading many of the fundamentals of the Christian faith are up for grabs. Teaching about biblical inerrancy and the reality of hell are cast aside while God's nature and God's grace are turned into anything one wants them to be. Problem with always talking about God being love is you forget he's also a judge and he is very angry. Script, he calls himself compassionate and slow to anger, but let's talk about this. He's had 6,000 years to be angry and he has held it in check. When the tribulation happens, he will no longer hold it in check, and that's the part we don't talk about. All right, another question? Maybe Tara should move to that table. <laughs> so I was just reading um, something that, that mimics this, is that, um, you know, there's so many people that vent their own form of morality in media, and they just don't, they take, they don't have filters. But when it comes to, and they, they vent their anger, and 
And yet when it comes to God being angry, they say, how dare he, you know? Mm -hmm. And, and it's just, it's amazing the double standard that they don't realize that yes, God is love, but if he doesn't get angry at the things that we are doing, then he's not a God of love. You're right. Uh, it's funny to me, and I've actually said this to people, you have to do it in a way that they don't get too offended. They'll be offended, but okay. Um, when they're angry at God because God took something out of their life, he took this person out of their life, or he, you know, he, they lost their job, and they're angry at God, I say, okay, you can be angry at God. He can handle that. But how many times did you thank him when the good things were coming? When you bought a new house, when you got married, when you had a child you wanted, when you got this new job? Did you thank him for that, or was it just assumed you deserved it? No one says a word, because that's really what we all do. We get angry with God for what he takes, but we don't thank him for all the times he gives. And if you look at our nation, we haven't. Um, we've been a very prosperous nation. We don't deserve to be prosperous anymore. We probably won't be for much longer. But, and, and the world. That's the other thing about the Antichrist you have to know is coming. It's not necessarily in this book. It might be in some of the end chapters. One of the things that's going to happen almost to a T, all of the world markets are going to crash. They have to, because the Antichrist has to have a reason to step in. And what's the one reason the whole world looks at? Money. So we've teetered on it many times. We haven't come to the point where every market, the Asian market, the European market, and the U.S. market all crash at the same time but that will happen at some point. Uh, seeing that you're on the money thing, I always thought to myself, my dad is always, you know, have cash, have cash on you. And to me, it's like, well, I have a debit card, same thing, right? And it just dawned on me earlier, you don't have cash. What does the cash say? In God we trust. No wonder yeah. why they want to take it out. And it just dawned on me. I know I'm a young Christian yet, but <laughs> just thought it was kind of neat. Yeah. The other thing, they're, they're going to a cashless society. You're seeing that more and more. So, like, I'll give you an example. I used to go to, my sister used to get tickets for the Packer games, and I used to go with her occasionally, not every time, but enough. <clears throat> Over the years, they always took cash to pay for everything. Like, if you were buying, you know, an ice cream or you were buying a hot chocolate, they would take cash or a credit card. Everything is cashless now. Everything. To get into the, the game, you have to have your phone to scan the tickets. You get to the place where you order food, you have to have something either on your phone or in your pocket that they can scan. They no longer take cash. So we are moving in that direction. Most places now don't take cash. A lot of them don't. There'll be more and more in the future. They're going to take that out because one of the things they can't control is how much cash you carry in your pocket. They can control what you have in your bank account. So if they don't like what I'm doing, what they will do is they'll shut my bank account down, they will confiscate the money, and I will have nothing. And that's coming in the very near future, I will tell you that. In fact, if you go back to Canada and that law, what I know about the Canadian premier, the president, however you want to say his name. I, um, Justin Trudeau. Yeah, he's been there for a while. He is one of the big wigs in the world group that is trying to make us all one um, big group in the world, and he's big into a non-cash society. So he's one of the he's been in, he's been in this group, World Economic Forum. Yep. Well, and it was called something else before that. What I'll tell you, it, it's been around for generations. It's been around for probably 20, 30, 40, 50 years. We haven't known about it. It's become very dominant now, and they are in the news. They don't always like the news because some of the stuff that's being said is very antagonistic toward them, and it's being, Canada's been part of that longer than we have. We, in fact, none of our presidents have really been part of it, and I don't think Biden is at this point. So for whatever the reason, the U.S. has stayed outside of that. We've got people in the U.S. who are part of it, but they're not the leaders. Trudeau is one of the ones that's been in it from the start. So I'm not surprised they're a little bit ahead of us in that and starting to do some of those things, but that's, that's the way the world is going to look. Okay, so cashless society is a biggie. 
what about, I always think about how we are so into our devices, our control goes everywhere. I mean, our thermostats in our house, our refrigerators, our garage door openers, everything. They can crash everything, and we're just going to be sitting there with our mouths hanging open. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. Because even if you had cash, they would take the cash. I will tell you, there is not a way you're going to get out from underneath that thumb. That's, that's the world. I mean, if you look at the early church, what they dealt with, why are we surprised we're dealing with the same thing? And when Christ said, there are troubles in this world, but I have overcome them, why do you think he wrote that? Because we were going to have a good, easy life, which we have, but it's going away. So again, why are we surprised? Why are we upset? And greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. There's nothing they can do. In fact, Christ said, don't fear men who can kill you. Fear me who can take your soul. So if you've got a secure place with Christ, you have nothing to fear. That was actually the sermon that I heard on Sunday in Madison. He talked about how the resurrection, and he took one thing. He said, I've never done this before. One thing, fear, and what it does to fear. And it should totally take it out of your life. We should fear absolutely nothing. Someone else has it. Okay. You know, it's why we need to build into our kids and our grandkids and our young families because for those that have children, this is going to be so much harder mm -hmm. if they take your kids or if they um, make life hard for your kids. It's going to be hard to stand, and the kids need to know, the parents need to know how to stand strong during this time. And I think we need to practice, you know, don't wait till we can't share our faith to say, are we going to, <laughs> to do that? Right. We need to be practicing now and see the faithfulness of God in that, whether we get rejection or whether we get, you know, people turning to him and just building our faith so that we can stand strong at that time. Um, I was reading something this week that said, if you share your faith with someone else, you become more excited about your faith than you've ever been before. And it's true. If you've ever shared with someone and seeing them, their eyes open, and they accept Christ, it is the most amazing thing. Now, you will get shut down a lot of the time, but it doesn't really matter. That's God's problem, not my problem. It's not me that's the messenger. It's the message that's got the power. Just on the following up on what Susie was saying, that um, in the Middle East, in, in Cairo, I, I just know that their, their mindset is training their children to go into a classroom where the teachers are going to be abusing them because of their faith and all mm -hmm. that. And so they actually have normal discussions about, so if you are ever taken away, this is what you do. And we just don't even fathom that kind of thinking. And we, um, because I think it is the mindset that uh, that can't happen here. You know, that happens over there. And, um, and, and just the training and the different discussions that they have um, is all about the reality of persecution and, and what we believe and what you need to do. Yeah. Um, even here, even back when my kids were young, I remember them being taught in science certain things, and I kept saying to them, this is a lie. <clears throat> now what I'm going to tell you, this is what God says. Science wasn't there on those seven days. God was. And if he tells us this is the way he did it, I believe it. But to pass the test, go ahead and spew their lie at them. You have to do that to pass. But no, it's a lie. So that's one of the things. It's not that you can go through society calling out every little thing, because you will, that is hate. That is, that is absolute hate but you've got to teach them to have discerning minds. What's a lie? What's the truth? And sometimes you have to go with what the lie is because if you say the truth, you will flunk, and that's not going to do any of us any good. So even in sharing Christ, you don't call out their sin. You tell them about your sin, and then you share with them everyone is a sinner. I think that's one of the problems. We start to point fingers. You're living together. You're doing this. You're doing that. That's a sin. That's a sin. Problem is that they see you as ultra holy and you don't see yourself as a sinner until you say to them, 
I am the worst of sinners. You cannot imagine what goes through my head. I have been forgiven. You can be forgiven. That's the difference. So it's not about pointing things out to people. It's about being the light, being like them, but different. Does that make sense? Pointing Jesus, yeah. He's the only perfect one. I am not perfect. Ooh, believe me. Um, so going on with this, um, along with the, so dropping down below the, the Matthew one, which says, at that time, many will turn away from their faith and will betray and hate each other. I will tell you that's been happening all through the centuries. Um, in every generation, there's been persecution. In every generation, they have been um, calling out certain people. So my dad did this, my mom did that, my sister does this. But it's going to get worse in the end. That's the problem. These influences, along with other progressive postmodern ideas, sensibilities are slowly creeping into the evangelical circles and causing churches to water down or completely redefine the message of the gospel in order to appeal to a broader base. At each generation, Christians become less biblically literate or in, error is able to creep into the church with greater ease and frequency. What I've seen in a lot of churches, and I will be really blunt with this, and you've got to evaluate the church you're going to, but most churches do not teach all of scripture. They teach bits and pieces from the books they choose to teach from. So again, if we're not getting all of scripture, consider yourself illiterate. If you're not doing something to counter that, and I will tell you, Sunday mornings is not going to help you be literate in the Bible. It'll point you in the right direction, but you're still illiterate unless you take it on yourself and learn from it and read it and are constantly in it and comparing it and understanding what it says. Um, the ultimate fulfillment of end times apostasy will occur during the tribulation where one world false religious system will be established in conjunction with the one world government. We already see the groundwork for this being laid in various leaders, advocates for an acceptance of all religions. The ecumenical unity sounds warm and appealing, but scripture is clear that salvation comes only by the cross and only to those who believe in Christ and accept his offer of forgiveness, truth, and forgiveness. Truth is not relative. Competing facts concerning salvation, eternity are mutually exclusive. Logic demands that they cannot all be true. Again, if your church is not saying we are all sinners and you cannot get to heaven without a relationship with Christ, you need to get out of that church. Um, it is a fact that most churches are not teaching all of Scripture. So what I'm hearing a lot of, and I've had people tell me this, that they've left churches for this, um, several, a lot of pastors coming out of seminary do not believe that all of scripture is actual truth so they'll they'll go they'll jump around jonah they don't like jonah they don't like genesis they won't touch genesis because that that's just a poem that's not really what happened um they won't touch revelation at all and if they do it's allegory it's just it's signs pointing to things that have happened all the way through the church age so again, it's not about um, what we really know about Scripture. It's picking and choosing certain parts of Scripture to preach on. A word that's really popular, and I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but really popular in the Christian world right now is deconstructionism. Um, I have a close friend whose grandson has, who was a missionary, who has deconstructed. And what that means is he's taken everything he's learned and he's changed his mind on it. So he has walked away from the Bible. He doesn't believe it to be truth. He doesn't believe that God is real. He doesn't believe that salvation is the only way if there even is a God. So he has totally walked away and he's basically said, I've deconstructed my faith. Now, if you know anything about construction, it's building something up. Deconstruction is taking it apart. Um, he used to love to read C.S. Lewis. He won't touch C.S. Lewis anymore because C.S. Lewis is too blunt um, and he doesn't agree with him. So again, he's probably in his early 30s, um, but he has just decided, and he's grown up in a Christian home, I'm done. I'm out of here. Leave me alone. 
well, he may change. The problem is this is something that Christ told us was going to happen in this time near the end. So what you're hearing is a lot of Christians, and he called out two pastors who were both very famous, um, who have totally walked away from the faith. Um, her question is, no, if they're saved, they're always saved. The question is, were they ever saved? Um, and only God knows that. So... I'm not going to get into grieving the Holy Spirit. We've done that before, and it, it's, it is, it's basically what the Pharisees did. So if you want a really good example of what grieving the Holy Spirit is, study the Pharisees. Um, they knew all of Scripture, but they totally missed the Messiah and had him crucified. That's grieving the Holy Spirit. Form of religion, that's not religion. So quickly going to persecution. So deconstruction, going back to that. The main, the, main re, the main word, deconstruction, is used by individuals who've decided to walk away from the faith. It can also be used within churches of pastors who choose to not teach certain passages because they don't believe their actual truth. They believe their allegory. So they don't teach them, and they won't teach the word as inerrant. But it's much more common in someone like this friend of mine whose grandson walked away from the faith totally. That's what deconstruction is. Persecution. Year 2015 was the worst in history for persecuted and martyred Christians with an astounding 105,000 killed. That's twice as many as the previous year. And 2016 wasn't much better at 90,000. I think we've way topped that now because the, the actual persecution of Christians has gone up since that time. Um, there's also been, at the bottom of the page, a significant resurgence of anti-Semitism in Europe, and that will only worsen as Muslim refugees continue to make up a larger proportion of the population on the European continent. Countries like Iran and groups like Hezbollah continue to deny that Israel's right to exist as they were fumed terrorism and as a funnel terrorism her way, while the UN has long maintained a hostile posture to Israel. Um, October 8th is a really good example of that, which just happened last year, in that the UN is now calling Israel the perpetrator, not the Palestinians. Um, they're angry that a lot of children and women have been killed in the retaliation but that's what happens when you build tunnels to hide in under hospitals and schools. Um, and they, they ignore the fact that women and children were burned and killed in Israel. It's totally not even talked about. And if you look at our college campuses, it's huge. So that is part of the end time scenario. Um, so that's, I'm not going to get into that real deeply because we saw a lot of evidence in that. October 8th, and the, the fallout from it is still going on and on and on, much more toward the pro-Palestinian side than the pro-Israel side. Um, so I'm not going to, I'm not going to take a lot of time on that because I really want to spend some time on the rise of the occult. Um, if you watch any TV, um, there's a movie coming out, and I have a feeling it's this week right after Easter, which is interesting. It's called First Omen. Have you seen the ads for that? Yep. It's, um, it comes, so the setting looks to be a Catholic church or Catholic school. Um, they have nuns in their, their attire, and basically it's in a cult movie. It's, it's going deep into the cult. Um, so, be, be aware of that. I'm going to read an article in just a second here. The book of Revelation reveals that to us that the occult practices will run rampant in an unbelieving world during the tribulation period, during which time the masses will be fooled by great delusion. This being the case, we should expect to see the condition for this beginning to form as we draw closer to the tribulation. In recent decades, we've seen occult and satanic influences spread far and wide. Um, proliferation of psychics, witchcraft, astrology, and other occult practices 
have become increasingly more prevalent and integrated in the Western culture. I grew up in Madison, so I'll be honest with you. The occult was big time into Madison, even during my lifetime, even when I was a child. I'd go down on State Street, and there's all kinds of stores that sold occult stuff. Um, I was young enough to ignore it and not recognize how bad it was, but it was, it was huge. But now it's kind of taken over everywhere. Um, it's, it's interesting how much it has spread. Entertainment is a reflection of culture. You want to know where culture is headed, take a look at its arts and entertainment. Have you noticed that some Super Bowl halftime shows, primetime TV music awards, ceremonies, concerts, featuring various pop stars and festival events, and I'm not gonna get into all the very hypersexual and anti-Christian, man-centered and bizarre. Um, I'm not gonna get into the last paragraph. Um, it is just a lot more of the same. Um, but I do wanna read an article which I think is very pertinent to this. Um, hopefully we can get through this in the last two sections yet. Um, it's called Darkness Rising out of Olive Tree Ministries. This is a disheartening article to write, to be honest. We see darkness rising, yet we are called to be salt and light to a decaying world. Even if the world pushes back, let's try to counter the enemy wherever we see his presence. The world is imploding as we tread toward the tribulation. The devil is trying to strengthen his grip on the world, the church, and the billions of people. See, to, still, to see people literally worshiping the dark side takes one's breath away. The Grammys lead the way. Some of what I review in this article is not new news to you. This year, the Grammys, and I think this was last year. This is spring 2023, so yes, a year ago. Um, this year, the Grammys included a literal satanic performance by Sam Smith and Kim Petras. Don't know them? Glad I don't. The song was titled Unholy and included Sam Smith in a red devil costume and hat with horns surrounded by performers, some in cages wearing red costumes and dancing seductively. Flames surrounded them. The performance was intended to be satanic. Viewers would think they were peering into hell. That was just one. Super Bowl lives up to its reputation. 2023 Super Bowl halftime, and I will tell you there was more outcry on this than almost anything lived up to its outrageous reputation. It opened with the filth merchant, Rihanna, descending from the sky, surrounded by what could be described as dancing fallen angels. This generated more complaints than the, than the Grammys did. Commonwealth Games infect the world. The Commonwealth Games last July in Birmingham, England, had 72 nations participating. Then Prince Charles was an honorary guest. It included a ritualistic Baal worship in plain sight. But before that, dancers placed fingers on their heads to represent satanic horns as they were announcing the coming of the horned beast. The ceremony was blatantly Luciferian worship. A woman eventually climbed a gigantic bull and the crowd celebrated the woman riding out, of the out on the beast right out of Revelation 17. I wish I were making this up, but I am not. This is, was seen by tens of millions of people around the world. Gothard Base Tunnel celebrates Goatman. We can't leave out the Gothard Base Tunnel ceremony of 2016. This was attended by Europe's most powerful leaders. The opening ceremony was a dark, disturbing, and weirdly satanic ritual. The Gothard Tunnel is the world's longest tunnel projected, project in history. It goes through the Swiss Alps and took 17 years to complete. I didn't even know about this. It is considered the symbol of European unification, but does this require honoring Satan? During the eight hour ceremony, eventually a goat man or Baphomet appears and is the star of the show. People bow down to him once again. At the end of the long ceremony, the goat man is declared king of the world. This too was televised around the world. This is what they think of God. Europe threw God out of their continent decades ago, and they now seem to delight in honoring dark images. By creating overtly dark and occultic ceremonies, the elite tell the world, this is what we believe in, this is what we think of you, and this is what we think of God. On that day, when they will be held accountable, we may hear their mourning and their great regret. 
SatanCon 2023. The largest satanic gathering in history will take place April 28th through 30th, that's last spring, in Boston, Massachusetts. Attendees are promised a weekend of blasphemy and remembrance. Years ago, maybe a few fringe weirdos would get together for something like that. But this year, SatanCon has completely sold out six weeks in advance. This event reflects the tremendous evil that is rapidly growing all around us. Hundreds, if not thousands, will gather to celebrate darkness and Satan. The spirit of the Antichrist is fueling this. This unbel unbelieving element is racing towards the kingdom of the Antichrist. It is the spirit of the Antichrist that inspires these glorifications of darkness. You would not like to be present when they are cast into eternal darkness and the eternal lake of fire. Finally, they will no longer be celebrating, they will no longer be mocking, they will be wailing and begging for second chances. I haven't even described the Fox TV production in 2016 and 17 titled Lucifer that painted him as a really good guy. Or rapper Little Nas X, never heard of him, grossing out some of his closest fans by sliding down a pole to hell to give Satan a lap dance. I haven't described another cable production titled Little Demon. I haven't described the after-school Satan clubs designed to counter child evangelism Bible classes in the schools, and so much more. That's the world we live in. It's pretty blatant, and it's, it's definitely out there. Um, yeah, I told you, it gets worse. <laughs> um, scoffers. Um, He's talking about listening to, and I almost know who he's talking about, listening to famous shock jock on the radio. I have forgotten what the topic was, but this radio personality started belittling the Christian belief that Jesus was coming back. He thought Christians were weak-minded, brainwashed idiots because it had been almost 2,000 years since Jesus was on earth, yet they still believed Jesus would return one day. He said something along the lines, Face it, your Jesus is not coming back. He is not the savior of the world. He was just a man. This shock jock used the, on the basis, as the basis to mock other foundational aspects of Christianity, such as the resurrection and Jesus' sacrificial death for our sins. His comments were in passing, but they stood out to me because I had just recently heard a sermon on 2 Peter 3, 3 and 4, which states, Above all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is the coming he promised? This famous shock jock had both components. He scoffed at the idea of Christ's return, and he was well known for celebrating and highlighting extreme immorality, anything irreverent, shocking, or vulgar. This is just one example of how the world is increasingly mocking Christianity. Unfortunately, I have heard Christians say this. Uh, as I'm talking about end time stuff, I've had young Christians, younger generation Christians say, oh, for crying out loud, you guys have been saying that for years. It's 2,000 years. He's still not back. What are you worried about? And I'm going, are you dense or what? I didn't say that out loud, but um, yeah, they, they deserve it. But what I know about those younger Christians, the churches aren't teaching it. Why would they know? How would I expect them to know when no one is talking about it? I won't. They don't. Um, it's not their fault. It's the church, and that's what I'll, I'll leave it at that. Two sides, same coin. The positive and negative spiritual signs are two sides of the same coin. Both are, will be on full display. And this is on one, bottom of 183 all through the tribulation. As we draw near to the Lord's return, our God, who is full of mercy and grace, will extend every opportunity for people to trust in him before the rapture. Likewise, as Satan sees the same signs we do, he will do everything in his power to keep people from turning to the only one who can save them. Um, they will reach their apex, top of page 184, during the tribulation period. Revelation informs us that the occult practices and demonic activity will be prevalent around the world. At the same time, 144,000 Jewish evangelists will be boldly proclaiming the gospel all over the globe and vast numbers of people will choose to follow Christ and will become thoroughly committed to him, many to the point of martyrdom. The gloves will be off, there no, will be no pretense, nothing will be subtle or covert, Again, both sides of the spiritual coin will be on full and ultimate display. Even now, as we look around, we're beginning to see the spiritual conditions of the tribulation cast their shadows before their full arrival. And what I want to say is, 
like I said, when I started this, I can't believe within my lifetime the difference I've seen in the world I live in, um, both for the occult and also, and, and to blatantly worship the occult. It used to be more hidden and also to basically make fun and, and call Christians idiots, which, you know, I'm pretty thick-skinned. I don't think I care, but it will happen. And it's not, um, oh, that generation. <laughs> it's not a generational gap because you've always heard um, every generation say, I don't know what it is about that younger generation. And I think I've also heard that um, in today's world is, is that, just, yes, there is a generational gap. There always are. But what we're talking about isn't this generational gap. It is the progression of evil. It is, but it isn't. And I'll disagree with you on that in that it used to be fully talked about the end time stuff. When I was young, I heard a lot of it. Um, even my grandmother in her generation heard a lot. Going, coming out of World War I and World War II, it was talked about all the time in churches. Good luck finding a church that takes all of scripture and talks about end time stuff. You won't find very many. I think it's down into the, the single digit percentages of churches that are willing to talk about this. So is it the younger generation's fault? No, they've never heard it from their churches. And the young people I'm talking about are in their 30s and 40s now. They go to church every Sunday. They have never heard any of this stuff. And that's just point blank. That's the world we live in right now. Um, if you follow Jan Markle and some of the other ones who are, are big time end times people, what they'll tell you, most of the seminaries aren't even teaching it anymore, very few. If they give it any time at all, it'll be like an afternoon talking about it and then they'll move on to bigger and better things. So it is, it is part of the time we're living in that people do not understand. Never heard it, don't understand it, can't see what's going on around them. So it, there is definitely that. Anyone else? Anything on spiritual life in the world we live? What you've seen, what you're experiencing? You know, on Easter, our president declared a transgender remembrance or respect or something like that. And um, it just kind of overshadowed the Easter celebration that the White House used to do. And in fact, on the Easter egg hunt, there were no um, religious symbols allowed on the eggs. And so again, I just think that our country is trying to erase any form of godliness. Um, and it's just, it's just so evident to me. The only thing I will counter on that is it's that day, that gender whatever day has always been March 31st. And it happened, huh? Yeah. So it happened to fall on Easter, but I agree. The fact that that was talked about 99% more than the 0.1% the that it actually is Easter. But do you know how many days are on the calendar to celebrate transgender and LGBT and all of that that have been added? It's, it's amazing. Oh, yeah. Or Women's Day or mm -hmm. Black month or what I mean it's it, we're no longer one people group we're these diverse weird people groups that are celebrated and those of us who are white whatever we are totally not celebrated that's what I'll say and it's okay I, again if I'm ex this, this is my little I'm excited I'm mm -hmm. excited to see the end coming I'm excited we're getting there I never dreamed I'd be the generation that saw these things happen. Mm -hmm. So does it upset me? Yes and no. The good thing is that it upsets your neighbors. Did you know that? Even the ones who aren't saved. It's a great time to witness because they're terrified of what's going on. So great and, chance to get out there and say something different. And I do know on the Internet right now there's a lot of bad that comes through. But I know for my grandson... Um, his walk really increased because he started following something on the internet. And, um, you know, sometimes you have to speak into that a little bit because when they first start, 
they don't necessarily find the best people to follow, but they're people that are trying, you know. Yeah. And as you encourage them and, and offer other people they can follow, it really does help because that's they're not hearing it in church or they're maybe not going right. to church, but they're hearing it. Most of the stuff I have found is on the Internet or in books I've read that I've gotten off the Internet. So, again, um, there's several people I follow that are big into end time stuff and they have a lot of books. They talk to a lot of people. Um, if you're interested, I can give you names. But again, you have to, ba you have to balance. Don't get so into end time stuff that you stop living. That's the one thing I'll warn you of. You're so focused on end times that you're just in your house looking up every day saying, okay, God, come get me. We are still in the world to be a witness to the world and the light of the world and the salt. If salt loses its saltiness, what did he say about us? We should be cast out. So again, are we going to do something about it or are we just going to sit there and wring our hands and say, oh, we're at the end, we're at the end. It's kind of like selling everything you have and going to live on the mountain because God may come get you. Well, you may live there for a couple of years. Not a really good place to be. So again, I think it's, it's us saying, yes, this is going to happen, but this is our time. This is the only time we're going to have. So let's use it. Okay, following up on that, on following up on what you said, a lot of the churches are not teaching this. The majority of them are not teaching it. Now that we're being taught all this, and we go out and tell people, we're looking like we're the cult. You know, it's kind of like, how do we address this in a way that we don't look like First we're of all, lost you do our not, minds? You don't witness to someone telling them that God's going to rapture us out of here. That's meat, okay? You give people who aren't Christians and new Christians, you give them milk. So it's you give them the gospel, the good news that their sins can be forgiven. That's where you start. As you grow them, as you disciple them, then you get them into this. You don't start here. And I think that's one of the problems we have is we try to start here. It goes right over their head. They do think you're crazy, which if if you read it and you don't have the Holy Spirit living in you, it does sound crazy. So that's not where you start. But we're seeing all these signs of the end times and you get like you want to get out there and you want to share them and say this is part of the, especially to your family members maybe are, that are like our mine, our Christians going to different churches where it's not being taught. And it's like, and I know other people in my life that are going to different churches and this has never even been mentioned. It's like, I don't know how to even have, a, I want to have a conversation and it's like, they look at me with, like, I've just taken some poison or something. I think you hand them off a book like this and say, this is what I just read. It, it, it's interesting. See what you think and leave it at that. I think this is not the meat of scripture, okay? Next year, I'll go back into the meat of scripture. This is not the meat of scripture, what you feed Christians, you've got to figure out where they're at, how much they know, and then you add to it. So it's a really a discipleship thing. It is not a one time I'm going to hit you with this and then I'm going to move on. So, yeah, you're, you're going to turn a lot of people off if that's what you do. We all do that. I had a situation last evening. Um, my husband is ex-husband, lives with me. And he was raised in a whole different cult. Um, but he told me about two people that disappeared in a town that we used to live next to in Kansas. He said, maybe the husbands killed them. I said, why would you say that? Because they were two young women going to pick up their kids from school. And then he said, well, something else that could have happened. Somebody took them off and to hide them, whatever. Then he said, maybe they were raptured. I said, I don't think it happens that way. I think it doesn't happen two people in the whole world get raptured. And I, he said, what are you learning in that church you go to? And I had to walk away because I didn't know what he wanted me to say. I said, it doesn't happen that way. Well, how do you know how it happens? Yeah, scripture. <laughs> so how do I go back and start a conversation again? It's not funny. It was very sad. <laughs> online, which I shouldn't be doing, because <laughs> I was witnessing some, some atheists, and they, 
they were criticizing my belief in the Bible and stuff. And then they were got into politics on top of the religion, and they said something about Tom, Donald Trump being the Antichrist. And I said, no, he's not. That's, he's coming out of Europe. And that just really made sense to me. <laughs> The fact that an atheist would even call someone an anarch, I'm thinking, who cares? You don't believe in anything anyway. Um, that's another warning I'll give you. The internet is good for a lot of things. It is not good for witnessing. Witnessing needs to be done one-on-one, -on -one, or if you want to do a podcast that goes out to different people and they can respond, that's different. But just going on Facebook or Instagram, or I don't even know what the other ones are. I don't use them, but um, you're wasting your time because you, and, and arguing is never going to get you anywhere in Christianity. You can't be a light. And I will, I will be blunt with you. I know today's election day. Politics has nothing to do with scripture. Whoever is elected president will not be our savior. He may do some things we like. He may do some things we dislike. But what do we know about God? He will be controlled by God. Go out and vote, but don't let anyone get you into arguments about politics because Christians have done that over the years and we have sullied our name because we've, gotten, we've gone a certain direction and we are not witnessing the people we are basically shoving politics down their throat. And politics is not the way to win people to Christ. The gospel is the gospel. Did God use the Roman Empire for his good? We know he did. They became the Christian nation at 300 AD, 300 and something AD. Again, God will do what he's going to do, whether it's through one man or another man. They will do exactly what he wants them to do because his plan, scripture is very clear, his plan will continue to move forward no matter who's in office. So I, I tell you to vote, I will vote, but don't get upset about it. It's not worth your time. Look to, look to God, know that he's in control, and know that everything is in his hands. Always has been, always will be. And if you want a good example of that, go back to the Old Testament. He used the good and he used the bad to call people out. Anyone else? I forgot. This is what started it, is when Donald Trump started signing the Bibles and adding the Constitution to it or something. And in Revelations, when I look back at it, it doesn't say adding to the Bible, but it says don't take anything away. And I didn't know if it was just the book of Revelations or the whole Bible. I assumed it was the whole Bible. And I just felt that's where the Antichrist accusation came through by those people. So it was like, okay, I'm upset that he's done this when he's done it. And I believe, like you said, God's going to put in control whoever it's going to be no matter who it is, but it was like, I'm going, why did he do that? It just made things even more stirred up out there. Just like they tried to stir it up with saying the trans thing started on Easter, and that wasn't, that was 2009. Yeah, it's, it's the date, so it's, it's just, March 31st. Yeah, I think po pol politicians are just trying to do whatever to get us all riled so up. So my last thing today, what I'm going to tell you, you're getting upset about political things, it's not... No, yes, you are. I mean, you're, you're going that direction. What I'm going to tell you is why are we surprised when the unsaved world acts unsaved? Christ was very clear we are to be a light in a generation that's very dark. In every generation from the beginning with the 12 disciples all the way into our time is dark. They are mostly unsaved. Do not let that get under your skin. Who cares? That's the way the world is. Let it go and quit arguing the small points. And we all argue the small points. I will tell you that. Is Donald Trump a Christian? Is Biden a Christian? They both have claimed to be, but by their lifestyles, I would guess not. But it doesn't make a difference. Was Pilate a Christian? was Herod, and yet God put them into control. The Caesars, go, go read a book on the Caesars. If you really want a good example, the Caesars were 
called God, they were blatantly anti-Christian, and yet God put them in place for a very specific times. It doesn't make any difference. What difference does it make? It's your Bible. Let him sign what he wants. Who cares? That, that's the thing that bothers me about Christians. We get so upset about the small stuff. Rick and I talked about this on the way home from, on Sunday from Easter. We get so upset about the small stuff, and we get fearful of the world as we see it, and yet God told us the world is sin-filled. Get used to it. That's why you're the light. Go ahead. I just want to end on a fun note, totally different, and I'll, and I'll use the scripture that none of us know when he's returning. No. Or to rapture us. We know when he's returning, not to rapture us. So you and Lori and I have this thing, and the only thing I'm good at, in one, of the, one of the things I'm good at in the world is remembering numbers. So we are doing a countdown. Um, we did a five-year countdown that he was going to return a few years, whatever, three or four years ago, and he didn't come. Oh, no, it's come. probably eight or nine years ago eight now when we started ago, it. We did five years, and he didn't come back. We took a break. So this year we started, we figured it'd be three years. So in case you want to know, there's 1,003 days left, and I can remind you every week of the number of days, so when we speak, I'm, I look at my calendar, and I go, oh, we're on day whatever, and it's just kind of a fun thing because we don't know, but it, it, for me, it gives me a lot of hope, and it just kind of makes me laugh. So. But I'll say as a Christian, this is my challenge to you. Go out every day, look at the sky, and think today he could come back, and then leave it at that and go out and be a light. Don't focus on it all day. Focus on Christ. Focus on reaching others. But know that he could come back any day. And be excited about it. The changes we're seeing, instead of making us fearful, should make us excited. Because Satan knows his time is short. He's going to up the ante. Absolutely. But God is way more powerful. He says, we have more power with him in us than anything Satan can do. Um, with that, talking the political stuff, read Romans 13. That talks about that God has, mm -hmm. has instilled placed. and placed people in, yep. in the power. Whether we like them or not, right? Exactly, exactly. So God is still in control. He always will be. Yeah. He works all things together. Thank you. He works all things together for his good. Yeah. Romans 8. 28. 28. Okay. Um, one more thing I want to talk about. A uh, number of years ago, I was a camp counselor at a Christian camp. And it was my whole summer. I was in college. And I had a Satanist in my cabin. And I did not know that until um, a number of girls came to me that were in the cabin also in fear because of some of the things she was doing. Um, I pulled her away and sat down and talked with her with the director and asked her, what are you doing? And she explained what she was doing. And I said, do you not understand that Christ in you is more powerful than Satan in you? And, of course, she was not a Christian. And she goes, oh, yes. She goes, there were a number of times I tried to do things against you. But because you have Christ in you, I was unable to, to hurt you the way I've tried. And that has stuck with me all my life, knowing that Christ in me is more powerful than anything else. So when we talk about fear, we shouldn't be afraid. No. We should not be afraid. We can be concerned about future and things like that but we should not be afraid absolutely because christ lives in us and that's one thing i have always hung on to knowing that she could not touch me because of who lives in me we had the same thing that happened in the dominican republic unbeknownst to us we found out about halfway through the week that we were in a school and satanists had taken over the house next door to the school and every day and every night, there was groups of them praying against us to Satan that our work would be, that we'd get sick, that our work would be not done, that people wouldn't come. And I hate to admit, this. I kind of chuckled when I heard it, and I thought, good luck on that one. 
that neighborhood was the neighborhood that the pastors went back to about five years later to ask the churches and the people in the neighborhood if anything had changed since we'd been there. And they said, we cannot believe the change. Our churches are packed and there are p new people coming all the time. So even though the Satanists prayed against us, God won the day and it had nothing to do with us. We were only there for a week. It had to do with the spirit of God. So again, Satan can't touch us as we know from Job, unless God allows it. Um, anyway, we will close for today. Next week, um, we'll go on to the next chapter, which will talk about a lot of other things, the cultural things that we're seeing, which um, there's so many of them, that it, that's going to be a hard one to get through. So um, maybe write down some things that you see culturally that, that you identify with in your own life that you've seen changes in that we can share it next week. Lord willing, we'll be here next week. <laughs>